Paracis Global Worldwide and to the extraordinary meeting of the United States Paracis. You know, Frank just came along and said they've got more than 1,100 people that are attending, more than a dozen head of states and, you know, cherry pick people from around the world. Uh, just to unite, inspire, and create. These are the three verticals of today's Unite, Inspire, and Create. Uh, my name is Nidhar Charan, and I'm the Chairman CEO of Aura, and we are in the manufacturing business, but I'm trying to get some new technology in the last mile uh, for India and to, to do some bottoms of approach. Uh, one advantage I have tonight, with, and it's tonight for me, it's one o'clock in the night, with, when you have such a distinguished panel, uh, I got to say the lead. I have to sit back here and enjoy it. So let me start with just uh, a two-line two introduction for all the panelists we have. We've got Dr. James Bernstein. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, he's the Chairman CEO of Anywhere and has brought a, a very innovative game changer. No electricity, no power, portable sterilizer. That is a game changer in the world for healthcare. So you can read up about him on Google and TEDx. And uh, I think we'll talk about this later. Thank you for joining us, Dr. James Bernstein. Thank you for and, the introduction. Uh, we have George Wang uh, uh, from Portland, Oregon in the United States. And he's been pioneering, he's the chairman CEO of EBI and it's pioneering uh, the global contract manufacturing services business. And I believe he's been doing it for over 20 years and have brought 300 million plus products to the global marketplace. I'm sure, uh, John, you will bring your insights into the cooperation for global pandemic for the next one because the supply chain all comes into very handy. Yeah. Right. They love to share some thoughts. Yeah. Thank you for being with us. And uh, then we have Tanya Woods, Ottawa, Canada. Good morning and good afternoon. Um, a very, very eclectic game changer. I and mean, from Bitcoin uh, to being in the earlier in the software industry to a change maker. She's been on the advisor to the United Nations a Global Sustainable Development Group in Canada. And I know that... Uh, you have pioneered what I call, and you call it, the no cash resource community coming together to build some impact in the world. No cash resource. Now that's a very, very innovative one. She focuses on edge innovation and serving people. Thank you for being with us, Tanya. And then we have Elizabeth Kelly from the United Arab Emirates. And uh, again, a very eclectic life. Uh, I think you were brought up in a very spiritual, gurukul kind of uh, environment. And from there, you went on to become a fashion model and then led Cyber IQ, uh, have been involved with the uh, excellencies and the families and the royal families and the UAE. And, and I know your heart lies in uh, woman empowerment, uh, youth empowerment, child care. I know you won a very successful ETOS Global that is around uh, brand uh, on the internet, on the online of people. So thank you for being with us. It's a great subject we have, and I know we just gone through a big pandemic, and so we're talk trying to talk about uh, how do we cooperate against the next pandemic. So uh, this just four teaser questions for you, because I thought before we talk about the next one, what is it that I saw in this pandemic? And I saw some four fallacies and four things that I would say we need to take care of. First, I have, the United States has always been taking the lead in resolving world crisis so far. This is the first time I saw the United States was not, forget the leading part of it, I think the United States did pretty abysmal in, in, in managing, coping up with this COVID. So that's a one point that I just want to bring about. Uh, the second is, uh, in the initial stages of this pandemic coming out from uh, the Wuhan region, there was so much quietness and there was so much less data available to the global world that there probably was a, a barrier to the response to the world. And, and you know, 
EU is doing very well, but they were grappling in the first. And then still makes you of India, and now it's making probably a large number of cities in the world. That's a global situation. So that's a backdrop. I'll start with Dr. James Bernstein, if I may. Well, uh, do you want me to just to opine, or do you want to ask me questions? Yes, I will. I will ask you one thing that I I thought that because you are in the innovative space of something that you're bringing to the world. And, and I know that you have talked somewhere in your articles, the world pioneer gap. Yes. And, and you know, so how do you see this pioneer gap? So in the yeah, future? I'll go well. ahead. So there, there are a couple of things I'd like to say. First of all, um, it's very clear to me that, that the world today, the various all the different countries of the world, we don't really think of ourselves as a single globe, single world. Um, everybody's got their own nationalistic um, tendencies. Everybody's competing with everybody else. But the funny thing about uh, the pandemic is it really doesn't care. It really doesn't care at all. Uh, and so the world as a whole has suffered because we don't, get, we don't cooperate on things like this. Um, my, my niche, uh, is as an innovator. I'm a doctor and a surgeon, and, and I developed a, a solution to a major problem in the world, portable surgical instrument sterilizers that do not require electricity, heat, or water. Uh, and I've talked to many, many people about that, and whenever I talk to, to people about that, the first thing they say is, wow. Okay, what I've discovered is that for investors, wow does not lead to dollars. Okay, there's a gap between the, the wow and the dollars. Um, and Bill Gates has even written about this, that in, the innovation today uh, is stymied because big corporations do not invest in innovation. They wait for it to happen. Um, and innovators may get money from the mom and dad or rich uncle or the person across the street to get started, so-called angel investors. But when they need real money to get from the first little prototype to a, a marketable product, it's very difficult to get money. Uh, the pandemic, interestingly enough, has really magnified that problem. And I'm just going to give you a brief example of that. Um, if you read the news today, you probably read that the president of uh, Tanzania died today in his 60s of heart disease. If you read the article carefully, you'll find out that he was not in a hospital in Tanzania. He was in a hospital outside of Tanzania. And the reason for that is the healthcare system in Tanzania can't solve his problems. Um, and what we what we noticed during the pandemic is that because travel has been interrupted and because supply chains, and George, you would know this, supply chains have been dramatically interrupted, dramatically, uh, and, you know, the price of a container to ship something from Asia to the United States has gone from small to like twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a container or more. Um, countries that do not have their own internal development capacities, their own healthcare ecosystem, the complete ecosystem, find it really necessary all of a sudden to change that, to change that. So there's no pharmaceutical production of any import in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. There's no medical device development industry in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, if, you want, if you want to have an operation like George has, that's a contract manufacturer, there are none to speak of in Sub-Saharan Africa where there are gonna be a billion people born in the next 20 years. And that's, that's a billion babies born. And that means that 10% of those billion babies are supposed to be delivered by C-section and there are no, there's no capacity to do that. So. I just want to make the point that that the pandemic brings into focus some serious global issues, but they also bring into focus regional issues where there is a complete lack of capacity, and that's going to change by necessity, by necessity. Um, and you know, we we saw today a good example of the United States um, 
deciding to do something about a, a country that can't get access to vaccines. So the United States is giving AstraZeneca vaccine to Mexico today. And then we have the whole COVAX operation. So for me, right. and I think um, I talk about this a lot, it's really important for all of us around the world to work together to solve some of these problems because the virus is a global issue. And I'd like to just close with a little example of that, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> and that is for those of us who've had a fish tank growing up, I think most of us have had fish tanks. If you take a fish tank and you put one species of fish in the fish tank, like a guppy, and you put 10 of them in the tank and you put a piece of glass over the top of the tank and you go away for a year and you come back, and you can have a 100 tanks like that. And when you come back, they all have exactly the same number of guppies. And that's the number of guppies that the tank is able to hold. You can't take more. If, it, if the population falls below its maximum, they grow to that level. But if it goes above it, they die. The world today is a fish tank. And most, most of us don't think about it that way. You know, We think about we can build a little wall about in the corner of our fish tank and we're going to be fine. But the pandemic has proved how totally naive and wrong that is. And that's really got to change. And in my world, it means collaborating in the development of devices that make people healthy around the world. And we do that. So that's my opening shot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, doctor. And uh, thank you for those. I'll get back to you for another question later in the second round. Uh, George, you're sitting, and you've been sitting on global contract manufacturing and you've seen what happened during this time and you're talking about a future pandemic. What is the pandemic plan in terms of uh, business uh, operations and emergency planning in such a situation going forward for the next pandemic? If you could throw, because you deal with this on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, you know, uh EBI, I'm the founder and the CEO of this company, started 21 years ago. Our primary uh, business is really helping our clients to get uh, from their ideas to finish the product. We, we do the engineering, build and retail package, get the whole thing done in a faster, better, easier way. Because in the old days, that the a lot of investment the resource, right? Now, our idea was kind of like, there's always somebody somewhere in the world that can do this thing much quicker, cheaper, and better. So the question is, how do we integrate all these resources together and build a product faster? So with that idea, you know, we're on the <laughs> globalization side, you know, of all these, uh, now it's kind of localized, but our, our business is really helping uh, the clients who have less money, not much resource, to have their idea develop, build at a minimum cost. So by uh, reaching out to global uh, sources. And that will certainly uh, help bring a lot of uh, prosperity. For example, if everything's localized, right, you can have two products for one category. With the globalization, you may have 100 different varieties right, because of the prosperity. So, so that's the, you know. What's that, 1918, 1913? That's the last memorable one. So the, uh, uh, there are so many things to, to talk about it. I think one thing really and you'll learn is the, uh, for the next pandemic, what will be the, uh, what do we plan our business, you know, and what should be done, you know, um, like from now on, it's still not over yet. If this is over now, well, I, well we will run our business like before, you know, so uh, uh, this is a, I think the, the, the virus really teach human a real lesson. You are nobody, right? Regardless you are the president of a big country 
or you are a little guy, right? In front of the virus, you are nobody. So it's kind of like a, I calculate like a three dimension upper attack to human at the, at the, at the sales level, right? So all those great development means nothing to the virus. So, you know, it should have brought some humility to people, which unfortunately could go the other way. To make people even more crazier in most countries, right? Instead of learning, confess, wow, this is some real threat, right? You know, I, I kind of like uh, what Bill Gates was saying. This, this is a really something, you know, human beings being developed too fast, but now the society are in front of this very basic thing, you are nothing. Right? So I think that's sort of the reason I'm talking about that should, be have the, that should be the mentality, you know, down to the earth, have to think that way. Then you can come up with a, a plan, a humble and respectful plan. Okay, as a human being, right, let's work together. Whereas a business planning for the risk of management, how do we collaborate around a different country? How do we plan the business? Just in this kind of things happens for the, for the good of everyone, right? What, let's collaborate to do that. So I think that's, that's uh, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, um, business side, you know, the long supply chain, which certainly doesn't help. And then what's the uh, emergency need, right? And the inventory, the build. So those are, should be really on the uh, uh, agenda for every business. And, and unfortunately, I think it's impossible to do. Because- Nothing is impossible, George, nothing. Because from your CFO, they're not going to let you do that, right? And the politician probably wouldn't let you do that either. So now, but at least I think from the meeting, we should have that awareness, really. This is like a five dimension up to attacking the human. You know, should have built up the humble humility, being respectful to the virus, right, to, at this level. So you are nobody let alone everything you have, right? The society, the more sophisticated you build up, the more fragile it is, right? So, so that should be the real lesson learned, but I don't, I haven't seen people really talking from that angle. <laughs> so, so it's, yeah. We'll get there, George. Thank you for sharing your first thought on it, Well. Uh, I get to Tanya. Uh, Tanya, I know there's a lot of things very close to your heart, one of them is about uh, the food insecurity that you keep talking about. And uh, you've seen all of this play out during the COVID times. Taking cue from that food insecurity, uh, the lessons learned and how do you want to, if you were to be given the strategic uh, tool to plan something for the future, what would Tanya be saying or doing? <laughs> Thank you, Naraj. It's a perfect question. Um, we started studying nine years ago, global risk. The World Economic Forum's Global Risk Matrix is fantastic. If you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to learn about it. Um, it's one of those tools that you can play with, they have a various digital forms you can play with and see how impact interrelates. Depending on what the issue is, it will interrelate with other issues. So if we have a pandemic, for example, we will also then have some kind of impact on the environment, some kind of impact on jobs and employment security, some kind of impact on tax bases, some kind of impact on supply chains. And we've seen all of this come to bear in real time in a way that we were only looking at eight or nine years ago in a model. We were on the heels with our innovation, on the heels of the global financial crisis in 2008-9. We saw um, social bank collapse in Europe from five big social banks that supported communities down to half a social bank. We saw all kinds of new models of finance spur out of the last financial crisis, new kinds of business models, B Corp. We saw ESG start to emerge, investment metrics. We started to see science become a little different around money. But what we didn't actually see was further contemplation in depth at scale on what would happen if something more than money flattened us. 
And that was the longest gap that existed till now. We, we've seen it now. We know what's happening and we're going to see what's going to happen in the next decade because of it, because this isn't going to resolve in 60 days. Um, there's no bailout that you could throw at this to solve for the disaster that's happened in our communities. And it's not that it's so much new disaster. Well, there's some new disasters. It's that it's exposed existing weaknesses, existing gaps. It's shown us, as George has said, we are all equal um, you know, against the virus in many ways. We're all equal as humans, again, in many ways as to what supports are available. And if the president of a country can't use his own country's healthcare system to take care of himself, he's equal as well. The difference is he has the means to get out of his country to go somewhere else, but his people don't. And our look at this, we thought, okay, well, whatever the catalyst is that's going to level set us again, it's going to impact jobs. Whatever it is, it will impact jobs. And with job loss comes access to the bare necessities of life that we all need to survive, access to clean water, to shelter, and of course, to food. And we've already got food deserts in major cities. We've got all kinds of problems already existing around food, but if we can't access food, how will we sustain our well-being? How will we sustain ourselves as human beings? And so the world, um, the World Food Program put out an announcement in April of last year where they announced, they said, now more than ever, we desperately need more robust in-kind supply chains. And for someone who studied for many, many, many years, the gaps of the supply chains hyper-locally and equally globally around resources that are non-cash, Food has been at the top of the list as a need level in almost every community, and then it's healthcare services, and then we see it, you know, tiering depending on where you are contextually in the world as to what comes next. But food has almost always been at the top, so it was no surprise that they put out a call for support around food. What we've seen since, though, is a challenge to respond, and it's largely because of the way we've conceived assistance. The world has conceived assistance as the responsibility of governments and of NGOs. And when governments and NGOs can't figure out the path forward, or they can't make shipments across the world, or they can't easily justify sending large amounts of money to countries because they have to put it into their own for national emergencies, what happens? And what ends up happening is utter, utter devastation collapse. But from that, from that, you see new growth, you see new signs of hope, you see what Canadians have invented as a term called caremongering. You see people on the street trying to figure out how to help their neighbors again. You go back to the times of the 60s, the 50s, 100 years ago, the way communities worked before we even had money, we had barter, we had ways of exchange that would work to make sure our neighbors were okay. And you know, the hope I have for the moment is that we embrace that newness again. It's not new, new. It's been existing for a long time, but we've ignored it. And depending on where you are in the world, we haven't done it. So we've got a system in place now. We've, we've leveraged the newness of the time with our technology. We have an online in kind of place we've launched right in the middle of the pandemic. And, and to James's point, I mean, unfunded, built entirely in kind for the most part, but for a government uh, program that gave us, I think, $100,000 after eight years of R&D. Um, but, you know, regardless, some of the most important things don't always get the best returns on investment according to the standard terms of Silicon Valley or world PCs. But it doesn't mean they're not worthwhile at all. It just means they don't get it over there, but it's fine. In our case, people need to eat. In our case, people need access to drugs. They need access to health care. And guess what else? There is an abundance of resources really in our local communities if we can just bring them to be seen and start connecting the dots. So that's what we're working on, and, and that's some of what the pandemic has shown us. Thank you. I'll get back to you with the second point in the second round, and I get to Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, you've been uh, an ambassador on many forums globally, so you, what is very close to your heart is global collaboration. Right? And in this pandemic, uh, what do you think are our options for global collaboration or global coordination? Uh, do you think it's using the World Health Organization or some other institutions of that sort? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I personally feel that I think the key word here is preparedness. So what happens is for, for global uh, cooperation, but it's very vital to prevent zoonosis. Zoonosis of diseases spread from animals to humans in different countries. And to prevent its spread to countries 
from one country to another and making it a pandemic. Now we need to uh, we need to kind of focus and tackle the three main factors which are involved here. Uh, the first is <clears throat> the source. Sorry, uh, source such as animals or birds. Second is the germ, which means the virus and bacteria, etc. And third is the human being. So, uh, what is the starting point? Initially, we noticed that. Nobody knew how to handle it, handle this entire situation. My father is a doctor here in Dubai, and uh, everybody was just asked to kind of wear mask and be in the house. Such things never happened. Everybody was confused, and it took a lot of time for WHO to declare it a pandemic. So uh, I feel, and we've been learning. Who knew that it started in 2020 Feb and I think March. And when everything started to shut down, people were stuck here and there. And um, people did not know. Here, now we have experience. It's been, it's been a year and we're still dealing with it. I saw it in the news um, that in Europe, there's going to be another shutdown. And uh, so I think we need to create an authority which is much larger than WHO, which involves WHO, UN, IMF, uh, World Bank, International Labor Organization, World Tourism Organization, uh, so that we can control people from moving, uh, we can take precautions, medical, aerobiological, animal welfare organizations, etc., all on one platform. And, and this will be a permanent or a quasi-permanent international task force to collate with all of the agencies needed to prevent a pandemic like that. Uh, what will uh, this world uh, authority do? Uh, so what we can expect is that they can constantly pool resources related to human medical and microbiological microbiolo research, then uh, veterinary uh, medical research, entom uh, entomology and environmental biology research, and probably the research of the vaccine because uh, it's all experimental at the moment. We are facing a lot of issues with the vaccine and everything is still an experiment, but then we have, we have become better with time. And uh, how can all of this be done? So basically I feel there are three main links in this pandemic. First is the germ. Second is the animals. Uh, and third is uh, human beings. So uh, what can be done? So worldwide standardization of care of animals and birds. So basically animal diseases, medications of animals, vaccinations of animals. Uh, this will include animals and birds whose meat is consumed as food, who are domesticated for farm, transport and circuses, who are in sanctuaries and zoos and who are used in the lab for experiments. And an emergency international network should be kept in place in case there is an outbreak. Now, germs involved in the pandemic now and in future could be bacteria, viruses, protozoa, algae, fungi, multicellular parasites. Uh, these may be transmitted by physical contact through surfaces uh, like uh, mobile phones, keys, elevator knobs, uh, keyboards, etc., through air, uh, through water and food, uh, through contaminated hands or utensils. And sharing of information is most important. What kind of information? Which means uh, germs behavior, mutation, how they attack host, and how they can be destroyed, etc. Or insects behavior, where they breed, how they bite, what diseases do they transmit? Or human beings, uh, how can we handle that is close contact and crowding, most common cause of spread. Best proven methods to prevent pandemic is social distancing, isolation, hand sanitization, use of face masks. Now, problem with vaccination in new pandemic could be vaccination takes time and may or may not be as effective as we expect, like we're seeing uh, these days. It's all an experiment. So vaccination for any uh, new germ uh, cannot be like 
predicted and therefore cannot be uh, pre-manufactured. So I think uh, to conclude, I would say the key word for global cooperation in pandemic are first create a pandemic specific world authority that succeeds WHO with wider international network okay. and then okay. address three main areas involved, the reservoir, germ and human beings and international coordination, speaking a common language and sending a common message all over the world. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So I see the time clock. We got 15 more minutes. So if I may come back to each one of you for another set of questions with a request that we can take maybe two minutes or no more for the second question so that we can come back with the key takeaway points at the end. So I'll get back to Bernstein. I know the other word that I, that you always very uh, closely talk about is the denominator. <laughs> I got you on that one, right? So, right. I'm glad you remembered that one. Well, so I'm, 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 factor, and how do you take the denominator factor lessons from this one going to mitigating the next one? <laughs> so, one of my it favorite is, points of view is, yeah. For those of us who have children, ask your children sometime what percentage of their future life one day is. And of course, the denominator for them is very, very big. So it's basically zero. When you get to be my age, or if you have terminal cancer, the denominator is very small. Uh, what that merely highlights is how do we use our time every day? And what is the return and investment on our time? So I just want to comment very briefly on what other people have said, just very quickly. So George, I think about, I used to, I ran Dr. Jonas Salk's laboratory at the Salk Institute, the, the gentleman who cured polio, uh, which is a real act of leverage of time because the time he invested to make that vaccine, he's eliminated polio in the world. Seven and a half billion people don't have polio that might have had it. You have, George, you have 25, 30 years, I don't know, I forget how many years his experience in contract manufacture, supply chains, design, and all of that stuff. And the, for me, the greatest value you could contribute to the world today is to go to places like Ethiopia or Nigeria or Uganda or the Middle East and duplicate what you do there. Duplicate it. You have created your own ecosystem in this country, but I don't think it works anymore uh, to, to run around the world um, and get them to give you things so you can make things here. I think it's really important for to duplicate what you've done in other parts of the world because that has a huge multiplier effect. So that's my first comment. And if I may comment on utopia, um, Elizabeth, you're a utopian woman, which I have a lot of respect for. But the problem with utopia is, is that it doesn't factor in human nature, right? And the problem with big organizations is that they try and regulate the behavior of individuals. And all you have to do is look at the United States right now to see the problem with trying to regulate behavior, trying to get one state out of 50 in the United States to behave in a rational fashion with respect to vaccines or masks is a very, very difficult task. So, for example, George, I'd love to get you involved with the project in Ethiopia that I'm trying to get off the ground, which is basically to give them the ability to do contract manufacture in Ethiopia. They, they don't have the ecosystem to do that, so they can't even make the simplest little medical device like a bedside monitor or a pin for a leg because they don't know how to do it and they don't have the educational system, the finance system, the regulatory system, the whole ecosystem. So that's a, that's a lot of people who can benefit from having you help them do that. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Elizabeth, you know, there are things happening in the world today that, that, that impact on something like animal viruses, and that's climate change. So if you want, and the, the removal of the, the ecological system to support bats, for example, they have to move into the cities because we're cutting down the trees. So um, I think for you to operationalize 
your utopian vision, which I totally support, you need to focus on something which is actually doable, right? Yeah. And make a difference. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, coming to George Wan, uh, the second quick question for two minutes. You, you, you run such global supply chains, you know, and, and this became under a lot of pressure. So what is the risk management that you would like to deploy going forward? Because that's a major, major disruption that we always look at in the, in the global supply chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, we can talk about this for the rest of the eight hours. But so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of like a, excited for everybody's, uh, uh, you know, impulse on this pandemic thing here. There are millions of angles to talk about it. Right? So, on the on the supply chain side, so basically, uh, what we're doing. So let's say we have product build some in the U.S., some in Mexico, some in China, Vietnam. So now, we are our plants have all the support. At least have two places. So maybe you know some is in China, some is in India. So we have two running in parallel and or in Mexico in the US. So we have we need to have double side. So that's at least that's one lesson learned from this pandemic uh, you know crisis. So um, back to the earlier days, you know, have a one more minute. So I was kind of experiencing when in China when they have that, right? In Wuhan, that's when that happened. In the first couple of days, I just keep thinking, who is the damn guy died on the bat? I was keep thinking that one guy, how did he change the world, changing back then, right? Changing the whole city lockdown, right? And then I think that this respectful fully, all these guys are laughing at it, right? Then they thought I have nothing to do with them. Until this one tiny little virus, right? Keep going, 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 the lockdown, all the political game, right? You know, my background is a scientist or engineer. So I look at it more physically, what's happening, right? From one person passing the night quietly, eventually, it's a perfect disaster, right? You know, for any, at any moment, you never thought it was going to be like this, right? So it's a perfect disaster. How does the virus beat up humans like nobody, right? Now the vaccine coming on. Hopefully, that's going to win the battle. Wait, you know. So on the supply chain side, you know, knowing this nature, you know, so um, the world is really like a cocoon, you know, all wiped together. We need to have duplicate solutions for everything we do without increase much of the cost because nobody will pay you a penny if you increase the cost, right? Unless you're from the government. That's the reality show. But we're trying to have Vietnam, India, you know, China, Mexico, U.S. for different type of thing. Eastern Europe happens, so we have had this deployed uh, with multiple redundancy. So, which will help to better weather this kind of a crisis when this happens. Got it. Got it, George. Thank you very much, Tanya. I know this no cash resource community that can be built. Um, I'd like to have your thoughts on that because it's a very novel idea. And, you know, I think uh, communities have proven during this pandemic what they can do, the power of that. So can you can you throw some light in two minutes in, about working it around the no-cash resource community building for mitigating some of these things that are going to come in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I think um, James brought out a number of good examples. So. James was explaining how he needs certain resources in order to make a change uh, in another part of the world. And each of those resources would be considered in kind. The time, the skills, the services, the talents, the goods, the space. Um, I think of everything non-cash. Just imagine what you would spend your cash on. And if you can get the community to provide it to you, then you don't need the cash. And, and these resources exist. I mean, we start with the presumption that we already have everything we need in the world to do what we want to do if we want to do it. We actually already have it. The hard thing is figuring out where it is and who has it. And then the next hard thing is creating the supply chain to the end in order for it to get there. So technology allows us to do that. We have digital marketplaces. We can look at eBay or you think of Kijiji or you think of 
you know, Amazon, we have marketplaces, and then we have logistics providers already. So we can think of FedEx and DHL and, you know, postal services and what have you already have them. All of them strung together have the capacity to offer the goods and services we need in order to get something from A to B. If it's just knowledge to share, if it's one doctor speaking to another doctor guiding a surgery in another part of the world, one researcher sharing what they know to add to a piece of the problem to unpack it and solve it. One person living in the area where the problem is can say, contextually listen, all you smart people working on the problem, <clears throat> in the point, I don't have X or Y. It's figuring out radical collaboration and inclusivity in a dialogue. And in order to do that, everybody has to be welcome to the table. And we have to start encouraging the way we're thinking about resourcing and procurement. Get rid of the fancy terms and just make it simple. Say, hey, we have a problem. We have to solve it together. And that's that's really how we started to go about it. So with the platform that we created, we said, okay, well, how about we just let people say what they have? And at the same time, we mean business and people and other organizations so they can say what they have. And at the other side of the equation, we see the charities and not for profits and local community organizations are serving on the ground. How about you tell people what you need? Very simply, imagine like you're having a wedding. You say, I need pots and pans. Well, they need pots and pans. They need cookbooks. They need clothing. They need food. It's very simple. And then they're together and we match them. And we say, hey, you can talk to each other. You can search each other. You can see by the resource. What you need. And then you can make a commitment and we track it like an accounting ledger because that's what we would do in a regular transaction. And so you organize it, the accounting ledger has it, it's all verified and received. And the next phase for us is, is putting in logistics providers. So we're, we have on our advisory board, we have products global and we have NVIDIA and we have very fancy names. And then we also have chairman of hospital in Ghana and we have a water expert in the US and we have and we have and so on and so on. So the community is rich of resources and we start there we realize we can actually solve our problems faster. So this is how we think about doing it. I think I'm getting some uh, alarms about the time. Uh, Elizabeth, one quick, we've got 30 seconds, but we can just say, I think there's a little bit of a trade, uh, uh, there's a deficit on trust with science, uh, which is cropped up. 30 seconds, because you got two minutes and we, 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 we stop streaming. All right, so basically, um, why people do not have trust in science, why WHO has lost, lost its credibility, uh, you know, and why people have so many doubts and suspicions in public. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of questions I have. Was the initial outbreak uh, of the pandemic due to the lab-produced virus, or was this information concealed? There are loads of questions. People are just confused. In some of the uh, you know, uh, did WHO respond early through uh, early enough or uh, do enough to or did enough to prevent the COVID-19 pandemic? How safe and effective uh, are COVID-19 vaccines? People do not trust science because everybody is confused and everybody, in spite of having people have reached the Mars. But uh, today we have questions and uh, and we do not have faith because we really do not know. So what do we do? I think uh, to create a world authority that involves much stronger than the just WHO or UN, as I mentioned in my previous answer, Thank and you. to make the international sharing of scientific research more transparent and keeping your ego aside, you know, and make an international effort to prevent the spread of false information and clarify doubts regarding any controversies using existing social media platforms um, or uh, some kind of platforms like reputation management platforms. over Thank all the other issues in the world. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think we have got 15 seconds. Thank you, everybody. I think we had some great conversation. Thank you, Dr. James Bernstein, George Wang, Tanya Woods, Elizabeth. I think there's a lot of takeaway points. As they say, Charles Darwin would have said, it's not always the strongest or the most intelligent, but the most adaptable that will survive. And maybe that's what we need to do in this collaboration. You have a great day. Wonderful. I'm going to stop streaming. We just finished the... We just closed this in 45 minutes. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank it's been a, for me, it's been a great pleasure meeting you all and listening to you all. You're all amazing people. Um, be proud Thank of you. what you're doing. Um, keep it at was it. a pleasure. And let's yeah. stay in touch. Let's stay in touch and do all something interesting. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. George, we're going to talk, you and I. Yeah, yeah. let's go to you. <laughs> it's all Elizabeth, I need to have a conversation with you, too. You've got a lot of energy, which we could definitely be using. Right. Okay.